So I want to start off by saying that the reason I am making this video is because I have been so helped through my faith journey and my faith crisis and my faith transition by hearing other women's stories, especially women. I've listened to a lot of men's stories too, but I think there's different things and issues women deal with than men do. And I want to say that a lot of the stories I've listened to have been so helpful or things I've read um, about how people come through a hard time in their life or when they're facing a crisis of faith. And so the reason I make this video isn't to hurt anybody or to um, throw anybody under the bus or, you know, say anybody's terrible or any of that. Um, the reason I'm making this is if you are somebody who has had questions or is in a place where you're not sure if you need to keep following the rules that someone else set up for you, this is why I'm making this video. I recognize that some people might not like this video. Some people might find it offensive. Um, I have no intention about um, harming anybody with my words or my story. This is just my story. And this is how I've experienced religion in my life. And some of the things that I've been through because of religion. And I just want to make that clear that I love the people who I grew up with, who I grew up around, who I spent years and years in church with. The, they are really, really great people. And I don't feel it's the people as much as the structure or system that creates this group that thinks a certain way, that acts in a certain way. Um, I don't think it's the individual people. I think it's the system that can be harmful sometimes. And so that's my disclaimer. If you don't want to listen any further, I invite you to click off of this video. And I have other, <laughs> I have other um, podcast episodes on my podcast channel that you can listen to instead. Um, I, I won't be hurt at all <laughs> if you don't listen. So first of all, and the re other reason I'm making this is because I've had people ask me, well, what religion did you grow up in? Because I have mentioned things here and there, especially because I've been doing these interviews with other guests who have had faith transitions or um, crisis of faith or have left religion or have found their own way of through spirituality or have found their own connection to God in, in whatever ways, because I'm just really curious about this topic because it's something that I have been struggling through. And I won't say that I'm at the end or I know any answers for myself. What I want to say is I'm, I'm feel ready to tell the story up to this point. Um, and if you listen to my podcast at all, Beautifully Bloomed, one of the episodes that I did just a couple episodes ago, um, it was in the teens. It was maybe episode 18 or 17 was with my daughter, Kendra. And she told a bit of her faith story and her leaving the church. And it just kind of inspired me that if she could tell hers, I could tell mine. And so her story is a little bit a part of my story too. So I just want to um, tell you that if you're more interested too in hearing about her story, you can go check it out on my podcast. Okay, so I want to start at the beginning the church I grew up in is not a really well-known church. It's not like I could just say it's the Catholic church or it's a Baptist or it's um, the apostolic Pentecostals, I think is what they call themselves, or it's Mormonism. You know, I, I, it's not well-known like those churches are. And so it was called the First Apostolic Lutheran Church, but it's part of Lestadianism. So there's the movement called Lestadianism. Now, I am not an expert in Lestadianism, but from the little bit I know or have read about, I, you know, there's not actually, if you ever go looking for it, there's not a ton of information. There is 
a wiki page <laughs> about it. Um, and I guess there is a couple books. I've even found a couple books about Lars Lestadius. But basically, and I don't have any dates. I didn't look up the history to write down years or dates. But basically, Lars Lestadius was a Swedish minister. I think he was even, and this is me kind of guessing if the, my words are right, but he was um, a state minister. I think Sweden had ministers of the state, maybe or ministers for the state, something like that. Ministers for the country. I don't know. However, they said that. But this, my understanding is he was a Swedish minister and he was serving the Sami people in Finland, Northern Finland. Um, and he started, the Sami people started seeing some major changes in their lives because of going to Lars Lestadius's sermons. And he grew a movement, kind of a movement. It was, it felt like a lot of it was based on giving up alcohol. That's, I mean, this is my understanding. I'm sure there was a lot more to it. But so this movement moved to the United States and it split off into many different groups. So there was many different groups about it. And that's about as much as I can tell you about how it got started. So I grew up in a um, congregation of that church and in Northern Michigan, Upper Michigan. And if you asked what the doctrine is, I would say, what they would say is there's no rules, but you know, what I would say is that we had a lot of traditions that we followed traditions as far as the way we dress or that we don't dress or the way the things we don't behave or the things we don't partake in. There were a lot of those kind of things. So I would say like, um, so as far as women go, I would say people didn't wear makeup. That doesn't mean everybody didn't wear makeup, but it felt like you didn't really belong if you were going to wear makeup. So no makeup no earrings, no nail polish, no tattoos, um, no movies. Uh, we didn't, we didn't grow up with a TV. Now I know some people did, but we didn't have a TV in our house. Um, what else? No drinking, of course, no drinking or, um, drugs except cigarettes seem to be fine, but drugs and drinking. No, um, trying to think of what else. I mean, obviously there's the things around premarital sex, you know, the, it, it's not, obviously it's not a good thing to have sex outside of marriage and divorce is really, really bad. Um, if you did get divorced, you wouldn't be able to get remarried in the church. So I guess those are some of the things. And if I think of anything else along the way here, um, I'll let you know, no dancing. Oh, that was a big one for me. I don't know why I forgot to tell you that one. Um, no dancing. Yeah. So there was things then as a teenager that, and well, the other thing I would say is when you're a kid in the church, you're really influenced, I guess, to stick around with the kids in the church because, you know, the things the other kids are doing at school, like going to dances and partying are things you can't really partake of, right? You can't go to a dance because you're not allowed to dance. Um, that was the stuff that I missed out on as a kid. I felt like an outsider in school, although I did have some really good friends in school. Actually, the funny thing is my friend group were Catholics. I had three, three of my closest friends in high school. They were all Catholics. So that's kind of a funny thing. Um, but I found it interesting because they had different just different things they did than I did. But somehow I felt like, well, we are right. Like we were told, here's the other thing about the church. We were told that we're the one right way. There's nobody like nobody else is the right way. This is the only way to get to heaven is believing this way. And, and some people would even say like drinking alcohol is a sin. So I used to have questions about this kind of stuff. And like, is dancing really a sin? Like I, you know, I couldn't, there were definitely questions I had as a kid that I couldn't resolve in my own mind. There's the 10 commandments. 
And then there's things like dancing or, or wearing earrings or makeup. I couldn't understand how that was a sin. It didn't say it in the Ten Commandments. But one thing I learned was anything that disconnects you from you from God, like, like maybe dancing or any kind of behavior that would take you away from God or take you away from um, worshiping God or I don't even know if that's the right word. I was really confused as a kid. I didn't often, in fact, did I ever bring these things up because I was very early on, it felt like there was no questioning. You sh if you question, there's there is no answers for the questions. So it was a very simple faith. And I would say it was a very humble, simple faith, right? Believe that you're a sinner. You need to continually ask for your sins to be forgiven. Um, you can forgive sins among e amongst each other. You don't need a preacher to forgive your sins. And just have a simple faith and believe that this is how it is. And you'll be saved at the end. God will come, you know. And I took that to heart. But I also had a question about my grandparents because my grandparents were not from our church. And I thought they're really nice people and they're loving and kind and we spend a lot of time with them, but they're not going to heaven. I don't understand that, you know? And so then of course, as I got older, we'd talk about, well, we're not here to judge um, and nobody, we can't judge who's going to be going to heaven or not. So then I started the question, well, then why can't I follow my own way? Why can't I feel what's right for me and still go to heaven? And so there's all these weird questions about it. And I have a list over here to make sure that I don't miss something important. So the great things about growing up in the church, I want to say there were some amazing things, right? So families were pretty large. I mean, our family was only five kids because that was a small family. From what I could see, that was a small family. Um, but I, I do feel like we had a lot of cousins and I had, like, you always had friends that were your age when you went places. Like if you went to visit even a different state, we usually could visit a place where there were other Christians like us and you'd have kids, you'd have the kids group, right? Those kids believe the same things you do and they do, they act the same way and they do the same things or don't do the same things. So there's a kinship there. So I remember a lot of large family gatherings and a lot of visiting with other Christians and just hanging out and, um, you know, playing games and having picnics and going on camping trips with other Christians. And there's some really good childhood memories there. So I would say that was the good side. And then the, the uncomfortable side is being in a school where there's hardly any other Christians, quote Christians, um, and feeling really left out and thinking and people thinking I'm weird. <laughs> like I was weird, right? Cause I couldn't, they felt like, well, you're not allowed to do anything, you know? And it's hard for them to understand. And it's also, there's no answers. I don't have any answers for them as to why I can't go to the movies, you know, besides the fact that somehow if you go into the movie theater, you're, you're going to go to hell or you're with bad people, or I don't really know, like that was sort of my, I just kind of tried to like ignore it, right? As a kid, I just tried to ignore that questioning I had going on in my head because I don't, there wasn't an answer. Why can't I go to a dance? I, I actually did ask that one time. And I think the answer I might've gotten was, it's something about women and men, you know, well, sometimes that dances, people dance with different partners. And I felt like there was some kind of issue with sexual feelings or something. I don't know. That's what I got from that question. And it didn't really answer my full question. So then I stopped asking questions. So I went along with the program. Um, I would say that, and I don't know how to word this well, because I really always wanted a family. I always wanted to be a mom and I wanted a family, but I also wanted to have a career. And so I, I had this fight in my mind about what I saw many Christians, the, let's just say the best ideal thing was for you as a woman to get married, 
to a Christian man and to start having kids and have as many as God will give you. I heard that term over and over again, have as many as God will give you, meaning you shouldn't use birth control, right? So this is, again, there's these large families. Now I saw so many large families that were really close knit, seemed like they were really doing well, that um, very loving families, their kids were, I felt very well raised and in a loving home. So I don't have anything against big families, but I did not want to have that many kids. I just wanted a career too, right? And I always knew this about myself. At one time I thought I, well, maybe I'm supposed to have eight kids. Like, I was like, oh, let's get ready. But really I just wanted, I wanted a nice size family and I wanted a career and I didn't see anything wrong with that. But the ideal wasn't that. The ideal was the mom stays home, the dad goes to work and yeah, stay at home moms. That was the ideal. And the funny thing is, I know there's so many women who are working who really want to stay at home. I totally get that. For all you working moms out there, I mean, I feel if you want to stay home, I feel for you. If you are out there, you want to stay home, but you're not able to stay home, you have to go to work. I had the privilege of having a husband who could support us. And if I wanted to stay home, I could stay home. And if I wanted to go to work, I did go to work. And I don't, so I, I'm really grateful for that. I didn't, I did have a choice and many women wouldn't maybe have a choice, but in our church, it was more like, even if there wasn't enough, it still didn't seem right sometimes for the woman to go to work, even if there needed, if, if the family needed more support, they struggled in a way to not have the woman go to work. Right. So there was these things that I had a, just a difference in. I just had a difference of opinion and I tried to keep it to myself because I wanted to fit in. The other thing is I didn't fit in because I would hear these things and I didn't agree with them, but I didn't feel like I could speak up and say what I thought about them because I felt like, wow, I think maybe they think I would be wrong, like I'm wrong or something. So anyways, I kept those things to myself in order to, to have friends and to have my kids be included. I really wanted to fit in. And I think that's something all of us face in society in all different ways. Like if you don't fit in and it feels like you're kicked out of the tribe, it feels really scary. So I did marry a man for my church. I love my husband. We've been married for 30 years. Um, I've known him for most of my life. And some people think that's weird that he is my, he is my uncle's brother, which let's say that's my, the man married to my aunt. So, so we're like doubly related, right? But um, I'm not related by blood, but my grandma really got confused about that when we were getting married. But so I have known him most of my life. Um, we started dating in my senior year of high school. He was in college at the time and we hadn't known each other closely because he didn't grow up around me. We grew up like about an hour and a half apart from each other. So, but I knew of him because of the family stuff, right? So we started dating in high school and when I was in high school and we got married the year before we graduated from college. And I am very happily married and very grateful that he's in my life. And I wouldn't change that. But I would say though, when you grew up in that church, it felt like the push was to find a husband within the church, right? That was the easiest thing to do. I mean, or the thing, the best thing to do, right? Because then you know that he has the same values and, and he believes the same way. Or at least you think that now what I'm learning is we don't all believe the same way. I, I just don't think that everybody believes the same way there, but I feel like there's just this appearance of it <clears throat> for people like me. There was an appearance that everybody else believes this and I don't, uh oh, like I'm weird. <clears throat> Sorry. So, so I would say that I did follow that plan. But I also, my husband and I talked about before we got married that I would work. I mean, we did talk about that. And, you know, we just decided that would feel right for us. And so we got married and of course we got pregnant right away. Um, so we had four kids. We had 
four babies and um I did off and on work part-time throughout my career, still working part-time. I am an accountant. I really love my job. One interesting thing that did happen was I was going to go and interview with the CIA. <laughs> I'm like little old me from upper Michigan was thinking these big dreams of maybe I could be in the CIA. And I, I did. I always had these big visions and big dreams for my life. Um, not that raising children isn't a big vision and a big dream, but I just always thought there's more. There's more I want to do. I want to do all of it. Like I want to have kids. I want to have a family. I want to have a career, all the stuff. But the reason I didn't go, then I ended up not going to interview for the CIA was because I thought, I don't think that that is the path that I'm supposed to be on in this church. I was really scared actually of it. I was, I was very afraid of that. I was only what, 19, 20 I was probably 20, could have been 19 even at the time, no, probably 20, when I would have um, been making the decision to interview for that or not, like I was invited to interview. And it just felt like I had been dating Rob for a long time and we're going to get married. We're on this path. <laughs> we're doing the church path, right? We're going to get married. We're going to start having a family. I'm going to stay home and have some babies. And then maybe I'll go to work part-time. Like I had, like the path was laid out for us. That's the path we're supposed to go on. We're supposed to get married to the guy in the church, have the kids, raise them in church and get them to a point where they find somebody in church to marry and have kids to raise in the church. Like that's the way it goes. And so I hadn't really seen a whole lot of other examples of how it could go. So I did not interview for, with the CIA. Um, sometimes I think about that. What would have happened if I did? I don't know. I don't know what would have happened. Could it have been, would it have been different? Would I have still married Rob? Would I have, would we have moved to Washington DC? Would I, you know, sometimes it's fun to dream, right? But anyways, I did, we got married. Um, we did have our son. He was born early and he was born right before we graduated from college. I was taking exams like within days of having a baby, <laughs> the things we can do when we're young. Anyway, so that, so we did do the, that track and what happened, what I think happened when I started having kids is I'm like, yeah, I don't really know. Like there wasn't almost time to think about how to raise them in a church or not in a church or what church or what my, I don't even know what my beliefs were at this time. Cause I was just ignoring that and pushing that away. I had these questions and I don't have any answers. I'm just going to push that away. And I, we're just supposed to have the simple faith, right? You don't have to worry about it. Just have the simple faith that this is true. This is how we should act and behave and love God. And, you know, Jesus is our savior and get your sins forgiven. And you're going to go to heaven. That's it. It's simple. You don't need to worry about anything else. So I think I just took on that for a while because I was raising these kids and this family and it, it's busy raising a family and then having a career along on side, right? It was just many, many busy years. And I was grateful to have friends in the church who were at the same stage raising their kids. I mean, that can feel comforting and good and having family meals with other you know, Christians and having Sunday school picnics and church programs and Christmas programs and um, having couples get togethers, you know, that kind of stuff can really build a community around you that feels safe and feels like they're similar to you and their values are similar. And so I just, I did that. That's what I did. Um, what happened though, in, let's see where I am I raising family. Yeah. So what happened in 2012 was the thing that started all of the questions again. So our son died by suicide unexpectedly in 2012. And this was not something that I thought was part of being a Christian. I'm like, wait a minute. I've done the things. I had a checklist of things that were, would make me quote successful in life. Like I always need this. I have these expectations and what are the things that need to be done, right? To meet these expectations and how do I be successful in this? Well, I thought the successful thing was find A, find the husband from church, B, have the kids, C, raise them in church, bring them to Sunday school, stick around church, you know, um, raise them with the same quote rules and traditions that we were raised with. And I had done all that, or we had done that. And 
when Trevor died by suicide, all of that went all of that was blown to pieces. Like what the heck happened? I re-examined what we did and what we didn't do. And, you know, I spent a while doing that. And I know I've heard from a lot of parents who haven't grown up in my church who have lost children to suicide. This is a similar thing we all went through. It's like, what did we do wrong? What did we miss? What did, what should we have done? Or what didn't we do? What should we have said? Or didn't we say, it's just a difficult process. In that difficult process of grieving and trying to heal from the grief and trying to help my family through the grief, I still had these three kids at home and they were grieving and my husband was grieving. So all of us grieving together, the faith stuff was really difficult because there were people who believed, and I don't think this is just in the church I grew up in. I think it's in other places. They, they believe that suicide is the ultimate sin. I heard this. We can only hope that he went to heaven or maybe the devil was speaking to him do you know like just weird things that when you're the mom grieving the loss of your son to suicide those are not helpful things and those are things that I hope I never say to anybody who loses a child to suicide so when that happened I really felt that it was time to reevaluate it took me a long time to reevaluate, but I stopped going to church for a bit just to take some space and a breather because actually the other thing that happened for me, and I think it might happen for women more than men, I had this visual of Trevor's coffin in the front of the church. Whenever I went to church, I had a visual of his coffin and I couldn't handle that. So I stayed away for a little while because of that. Um, and then when I stayed away, some people started questioning that, like, you need to be in church. It's really important that you're in church. So then I was like, that doesn't make sense either. Do I have to sit in the building in order to believe something? You know, there's all these questions I started having. So that happened. And about five years after that, our daughter, Kendra, came out as gay to us. And I, I don't know, she might have known before then, but to us, she came out as gay five years ago. Now, I didn't want to do this episode until Kendra did her episode and she told part of her story because I didn't want to tell her story for her. But now that she has told her story, I just wanted to say that it was hard but it wasn't as hard as it might have been if Trevor hadn't died already by suicide. So we already had gone through the most horrific thing I thought I could ever face as a parent. So when Kendra came out as gay, yeah, it was hard. It was really hard because, well, here's the thing. I have these thoughts about being the mom of the bride and, you know, um, having a son-in-law. You know, it's the normal things that you've been conditioned to believe are the things that are supposed to happen. It's the right way, whatever. So once again, I had all the thoughts I had to go through. I had all the, um, all the things that I had been conditioned to believe. <clears throat> and I had to wonder, what does this mean? You know, I had been taught that homosexuality is sinful and maybe like even if people think they are homosexuals they should um they shouldn't live that way i guess is what i would say and it it really kind of broke my heart that that was what i was taught to believe and now i have a daughter who is gay and how do i reconcile these things in my mind because i am a mom first so I'm a mom, these kids have come into my life and I really believe in things happen for a reason. I just do believe that if you ask me to explain it, it's one of those unexplainable things that I just believe deeply in my soul. I came to believe that about Trevor's death. So this was another thing that I was like, okay, there's a reason that I have a gay daughter. What is that here to teach me? There's something I'm here to learn about that or learn from that, or 
um, some way I'm going to show up more compassionately. And so I took that as my next lesson. I had already learned so much from Trevor's death. Now I was thinking about, you know, um, Kendra and being gay and what does that mean? And what does that mean about our future? And what does that mean for her? And, and does God love gay people? You know, all these weird, interesting, weird questions, right? So I just decided that God made her and I don't see that she chose to be this way. I know there's a lot of arguments about that stuff. And I read a lot of arguments about that stuff. And I've listened to a lot of things. Yeah, I went into research mode on that. So I had to reconcile that with this religion that I grew up in. Recognizing she'd never be able to have a wedding in the church. I don't think she wanted to. <laughs> she left church before I did. But anyways, she would never be able to have a wedding. And I thought, why is that? Why is she treated as less than? And that really bothered me. And so if you're not a mom of a gay child, this could be hard for you to understand. Um, I didn't think I'd ever have to deal with this issue. I never thought I had to deal with a suicide. So that made me question. And when I'm talking about my kids, I also want to say that Trevor's suicide brought in a lot of things too, because Trevor told us shortly before he died that he hadn't believed in God since seventh grade. And that was shocking to me. Like I wouldn't even know that my own child didn't believe that God existed. How is this? You know, he came to church every Sunday, just like us. He went and he got confirmed, you know, um, but once again, what I saw is that I am a rule follower. He's a rule follower. He's a perfectionist, just like me. In fact, he was probably more of a perfectionist and he was trying to follow these rules that he didn't really believe in. And that made me really sad. That really did make me sad. So Trevor, I think, opened up some thoughts for me about really examining what it is. What is God about? What is life about? What is church about? What is religion about? Trevor actually opened those because he died. That started my questioning and all of that stuff. So anyways, now I've got, you know, Trevor has died by suicide and Kendra's gay and I have to reconcile this. And I've just decided that I don't think it's wrong. And I don't think God doesn't love Kendra. I think God loves Kendra. God made Kendra. God made her the way she is. And she is in my life for a reason. And I'm here to learn from that and love her as she is. And I'm here to have more acceptance for people being who they are. And so that really, um, I think as far as the kids go, I was still going to church and still pretending, but then COVID happened and I decided to use that as an excuse to not go to church. And so, and it happened for so long, right? COVID was, went, went on for a while. So I just stopped going. And people started wondering <laughs> where I was after a while. But it gave me time to realize that I have a lot of things that I believe deeply that didn't fit within the church structure. Um, one of the things that I forgot to say in our marriage vows, there's this part that says the husband is the head of the wife, just as the Christ is the head of the church. Let me say that again. The husband is the head of the wife, just as Christ is the head of the church. I could not, even when we got married and, and had those, I don't think I ever fully believed it. I didn't integrate it into my beliefs. Um, I thought it was weird. And every time I go to a wedding, I hear those words again. And I'm just like, they kind of, they turn me off. They don't feel good to me. And so that's one thing I cannot agree with. I can't agree with it. <laughs> and I feel like it's one of the core doctrines or one of the core beliefs is that the man is the head. And I'm like, women, feminine energy is just as important as masculine energy. and. I have now gone out to study the history of Christianity, the history of the Bible, who wrote this stuff? Why did they write it? Um, where were they coming from? 
is it written by the people we think it's written by? I've done a lot of studying on the history of the Bible and it's very fascinating. And when I started the study of it, I was looking for the places where it said, thou shalt not wear um, earrings or thou shalt not have nail polish or thou shalt not dance. Like I was looking for the places where it said that. That's why I wanted to study the Bible. You know, we, we weren't really encouraged to study the Bible. In fact, what I heard, and this might not be what many people experienced at all, I don't know, but when some women got together and started having like weekly meetings in their home to just read the Bible together, it was really frowned upon by some other women. And I thought, so we're not allowed to read the Bible. Like, I don't know. I never really took it to heart that I should read the Bible. We weren't ever encouraged to read the Bible. We went to Sunday school and heard stories from the Bible, but I would say that um, there's a lot missing in the context of, how would you say the word? There's a lot missing in the context of what we were taught. The things that we're taught over and over again, the stories you hear over and over again, the, the things that were said over and over again, a lot of that, there's so many holes because the Bible is a big book. And if you don't understand the history of how it came to be to the King James version, that was another thing. You only use the King James version. Um, yeah, I, I started questioning all of that stuff. So yes, it's difficult. And having conversations with people who have grown up in that religion and have been doing that all their life. If you try to have a conversation about this particular topic, they don't probably have a whole lot to say about it or don't really want to talk about it because there isn't, I, I was in that exact same place. I was like, I have no explanation as to why we do this, this, and this, and why we don't do that. And why we use this version of the Bible and why, you know, I, there's no, good explanation. I don't have any explanation, but just have simple faith, just a simple childlike faith. You don't need anything else. Like literally that's kind of the answer, you know, just have faith. This is the way it's done. This is the way it should be done. This keeps us on the straight and narrow path. Again, I love those people. There's so many good people that I've known in my life and that have really cared for me and that I've been become friends with and I've spent a lot of time with and I can't I I can't attend that church anymore so it was in this year January that I wrote a letter to my my mom and dad and my sister and my two brothers and told them that I'm leaving the church and I just felt it was necessary for me to actually formally say it because there's this you know, I could just move away and just never, you know, but I felt like I wanted to be more real and more honest about things. And I wanted to actually talk about this stuff in my coaching practice and on my YouTube channel. And I wanted to talk about it on my podcast. And if I'm doing that without telling them the truth, I'm not being authentic to myself and I'm not really honoring my own truth. So I do think it's important. And this is something that I know some people I've heard other Christians even um, in general say that um, honoring your own truth, like there's some, there's something about church that we were taught, like, don't look inside yourself for the answers, right? Don't, no, don't go there. <laughs> and, and if you're having thoughts that are different than the beliefs that the church teaches, you know, it could be the devil. I actually thought that when I was a kid, oh my gosh, the devil might be speaking to me. Like if I had a question or a doubt, oh, the devil's speaking to me, I need to be forgiven for this sin. Like I'm sinning by having this thought. And I don't really believe that's true at all anymore. So I did go to therapy. Here's another thing. Okay. I went to therapy after Trevor died and my husband went to therapy. We sent our kids to therapy because the therapists aren't Christian, right? They're not our brand of Christian, I guess. That's not seen as helpful. Now, some people believe in therapy in the church I grew up in and many others, I don't think believe in therapy. I felt it was necessary to get our family through that tragedy we had been through. 
So we went through the therapy and I also sought out coaches. So I had therapists and coaches and I learned a lot about how the brain works and how our feelings work and how we create stuff in our life according to our feelings. I learned so much about life from those coaches and therapists. And a lot of it had to do with me coming back to what do I believe? Who am I? I, I guess I hadn't been asked those questions. I hadn't been asking those questions of myself. You know, when you're raising kids, if you're mom, you might understand this, like so much of your energy is focused on the kids and the husband for so many years, like taking care of your home and making sure the kids are healthy and well-fed and, you know, the house is clean. And there's a lot focused on the other people in your life. And I think too, one thing that big thing that happened is our youngest daughter graduated from high school in 2018, 19. What? <laughs> Anyways, I am losing track of time. So she graduated last year. Yeah, she graduated last year, I guess. Um, yeah, she graduated last year. And I, I felt like this new phase of my life was opening up. And I was like, what is next? And can I truly just be me without trying to be somebody or pretend something or um yeah, pretend to be somebody I'm not just to fit in with a group of people. Cause I feel like I did that for many years and I'm kind of, and, and you know what, you get comfortable doing that, even though then I think it causes a lot of health problems is so my assessment of that is my iron issues were caused by me trying to ignore my authenticity and trying to just push down what I really thought and what I really believed and just push it away and pretend it's not real. Right. I don't want to think that because that's wrong. So making myself wrong about things caused me health problems. And I am feeling like it's, it's a journey to get to just accepting me for me and then allowing myself to be me and then allowing myself to say what I believe, not in a way to tell other people they're wrong, but in a way to make myself be right also. Like, what if you're right and I'm right and the other person is right? You know, there's this weird thing where I feel like we were taught to judge people. That's not what we're supposed to do. We're not the judges and we're not supposed to be the judges. However, the, the feeling of it was that we only should stick with our own people because we're right. And those other people are wrong. And I just have a hard time with that now. Like I really have a hard time. I can't do that. And it's really difficult to, to reconcile the fact that I, I was so judgmental for so many years about so many people and so many things they were doing and the things that they should. And, and I even find it. So it's the black and white thinking, right? It's like, there's right and wrong. So you got to either do it this way or that way. And that's it. <laughs> and I've been like more open to seeing both sides of the story of all the things like religion and politics. Well, those are the two big ones or even health issues, right? Um, COVID stuff. Like I've been so much more open to like, well, what does that say? Where are they coming from? And why do they believe that? And what are they saying about it? And then the other side, well, where are they coming from? Why do they like, it's really hard to do that when you're in a religious community, that's really black and white. It's like, this is right. That's wrong. That's it. Like, and don't question it. Just have a simple faith. Just have the simple faith that that's the right thing. And the other thing is the wrong thing. Yeah. So I hope I don't, I'm not angry at people. I'm not angry at the way I grew up. In fact, I embrace the way I grew up. I think, well, all of that stuff that I went through was important in my life for me to get to where I am. And there's so many good things that I've learned and done. And so many things that I'm grateful for, um, for being in that community and in that church and learning all of that. There's a lot of good things about it. And I have a lot more to learn now that I am officially not a member of that church. I feel like I love studying the Bible and talking about different religions and different beliefs and finding out where people are on their faith journey and how are they finding community after yeah. How do you find community after you leave a religion? That's really hard for me. 
Because I think if I look back, one of my favorite things, any favorite memory is about being with people, being in a community is important to me. And I, yes, could I have just kind of gone along for the rest of my life? Maybe. I don't think it would feel good. It wouldn't be fun. It would be I would probably have had way more health issues more and more. And right now I'm working on healing some major issues and I want to just heal those more and more. And I feel like the healing part of the healing is telling the truth. Part of the healing is being me along with some actual other healing stuff that I got to do. But like that, I feel like it's all related, all of it, the thoughts and the feelings and allowing myself to be me or not, that's all related to how healthy I am. And I really want to be healthy and I want to enjoy life and I want to enjoy my kids and my husband and travel and go on vacations and have deep discussions about life and things. And I'm way more open to it than I was, well, before Trevor died. Yeah, I'm way more open to it now. So it's been a 10 year journey to get to this point. I don't know if I ever thought 10 years ago that I would be sitting here telling you about leaving the church and actually telling my truth. That was really hard for me. That was so hard for me. And I think I even made it to be worse in my head as to how people would react than it really ended up being as far as even in my family, I thought it would be way worse. And it wasn't, it was, it was, I have to say, I love my family. I love my mom and dad. I love my siblings. They're all good. They're doing what they believe and I'm doing what I believe. And we're still able to get together. And I think it's going to be fine. So if you are somebody who has experienced some kind of faith transition or faith crisis or have left a religion or have found something for yourself or are being more you, let me know. I love to talk with others who have these kind of issues going on in their life. I love to hear about how people are blooming. I should have another program blooming after religion. <laughs> so maybe that's another program for me to start, but I love talking about this stuff. I think that it's important and because really my whole goal is to have people be themselves. That's it. My whole goal in life. And I feel like this has been what I've been trying to get to from the time Trevor died. The, the thing is, can't we all be ourselves and just love ourselves for who we are so that we can love others for who they are? Like, how can you love anybody else for who they are if you can't really allow yourself to be yourself? There's some healing that needs to be done. There's some trauma there. Um, and I really believe that that is what has helped me the most through the coaching process and programs I've been through and through the therapy is what do you believe? What feels right to you? What feels right to you? Not what you know the structure of religion told you has to feel right to you or has to be what you do or has to be the way you live your life, but what actually feels right for you? Because all of us are on our own individual journeys. I mean, and we can choose to be a part of a group, of course, but I'm saying, even if you're part of a group, can you have your own belief system within that group without being kicked out of the tribe? Um, I just don't, I wasn't confident enough or courageous enough to have that conversation with people with more than a couple people inside the church. I just, it felt so uncomfortable. And I think that can be part of the problem is when religion or when a group makes you feel like if you don't believe this way, and if you talk differently than that belief, that you're going to feel really ostracized or left out or well, that is the problem <laughs> left out, right? Then you get left out. So, and I think it's not just church. I think any group can become that, to be honest, I've been a part of other groups that aren't religious based 
Um, so there, I, there's a weird thing with groups and I've been noticing this myself and I'm like, how can we have communities where open communication is allowed and it's, um, it's compassionate and it's loving and it's accepting that there are different points of view. That's a hard one. It's a tough one. I, I don't think I found a great community yet that allows that. So I'm on the lookout. But thank you so much for listening to this. I really have been worried and nervous about talking about this, but I know that it's necessary and it's a part of the work that I do also is, is to help people to be who they are. I just want to bring light to the subject. I want to talk about things that are unacceptable to talk about, for instance, and I'm not sure why they're unacceptable. I just think it's uncomfortable. That's all. It's just uncomfortable. And we don't need to be uncomfortable talking about who we are and what we truly believe. And there, and recognizing there's other people who believe something totally different. And that's okay too. As long as I'm allowed to believe what I believe and I can be myself. And you can be yourself and believe what you believe. And we can still be friends. That's what I would love. I would love for people of different, you know, different beliefs to be able to talk openly and be friends. So thank you so much for joining me today. And I look forward to talking to you next time.